biology, pre-med to um, psychology in that in that semester. And I haven't looked back, you know, as a director of the department work for at Morgan State, you know, to this day, uh, you know. And so he's part of the, the unapologeticness of me. You know, he when I came in, he helped to refine me. He threw me the keys so many times to go pick up our special guests for the Race Relations Institute. I'm talking about from Dr. Dorothy Height and picking up her and her entourage. You know, Dr. Fred Price picking up him and his entourage. I thought I was picking these people. I would show up and they already got they, they, their caravan, their carpool already ready. So I'd meet them at the private airstrip and I would just escort them to wherever we was going. Uh, you know, to Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, you know, Chuck D, Max Roach, Harry Allen, you know, James Earl Jones, just, you know, the list goes on and on. And so he, part of what he did, he showed me that I'm responsible for more than myself. Yeah. And when I realized I that he was giving me the keys to his car to do it at first. And then we started renting vehicles. But, you know, and for me to understand, like, you know, it's bigger than me. You know, I started pulling my pants up, started tightening my belt, <laughs> you know, yeah. and eventually I, I stopped answering when people would call me the N word. And I stopped calling people that, you know, because yeah. I understood that, you know, we're, we're, we're bigger than that. We have more value than that. Yeah. And understanding the importance of power of psychology. I mean, I don't know if y'all remember, but my transition and even what I would DJ changed. And, you know, to this day, I'm kicking myself because I had an autographed copy of uh, Jay-Z's Reasonable Doubts, you know, and I gave that joint away. Yeah. And I mean, you know how much that would be worth now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, but, you know, no regrets. But, you know, just real quick, you know, just even being able to bring the people that we brought to the yard. Uh, Rob, you remember, you too, Mark, you know, two years in a row, we had Outkast, you know. Yeah. We had Jay Z, you know, with his first funny album. story about Outkast. I ended up braiding uh Andre 3000's hair. What I know, it, I don't even know how it happened. It was me and Tiffany Matthews, okay. And he was like, he needed his hair braided, and so I was That's... like, I can braid. Wow, <laughs> so I ended up braiding his hair for the concert. Funny story, I don't wow. even know how that happened, but I was like, Cause I Fisk. can braid, I promise that... I can braid. Yeah, fit. Fisk. Fisk. exactly. Yeah, but... They just felt they felt like they were at home. And Tiffany was like, I wish I could pray. She was mad at me, but I was like, I can pray. <laughs> but you can come yeah. with me because I don't want to go by myself again. I'm still a little college student. I don't want to go by myself. You right. can come with me. So I braided this hell on the tour bus. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, yeah. and so just you know, doing that kind of work so from there, working with Taraji P. Henson, the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation on our clinical clinical advisory board. Uh, we're doing great work, providing free therapy, you know, for different special groups, affinity groups, so for men and for women for children, you know, and it's just in cycles. We just provide free therapy. I mean, it's a wonderful role. I mean, if I could go back and change anything, I wouldn't change anything at all. Um, you know, it's what's got me where I am, you know. No, no, I complete. I, that's, that's so super dope. And I, and I'm, I'm so appreciative to you. And I've talked about how you guys are great men. And I talked about how Mark married my LS and how Robert married my profite and Jeff married my classmate. So you yeah. guys are smart, married Fiskites, great women <laughs> behind you. Great, great, great women behind you. Very, very smart. I want to, Mark, I want to get into the, the next question as a superintendent, because as you gave your introduction, you spoke a little bit about um, barriers and not having AP courses. Like, what are some of the barriers to access for education? Uh, oftentimes, it's adults. Mm. Um, mm. So I mean, like I have my AP data hot off the press. We just did a release mm -hmm. and I'm just going to speak to Anne Arundel County on Monday. But when I got here, I saw the same thing that I saw in Kansas City. This mm -hmm. deficit mindset of who can take it and who can't. And oftentimes mm -hmm. what you run into is this gatekeeper model. Uh, you know, I have a doctorate degree. I went to Fisk and did pretty well on and off the court, I never got invited to take an AP class in high school. Not because I couldn't mm. do it, but because of how I showed up and people didn't see it in me. Adults, mm. it's generally invite only. Mm. So two years ago when I came here, I said, I could tell you right now, that gatekeeper model is gone under my leadership. Mm. If we have children mm. that want to take AP classes, and, and I don't care about them scoring a three or better. The access to the rigor of that classroom alone will help these kids be better prepared for their post-secondary endeavors. So when we got rid of it, not only did we have hundreds and hundreds of more kids take the test, but at the end of my first year last year, 
African-American and multiracial kids had the largest increases with access, uh, taking the courses and taking the actual exam. And our AP scores as a district went up by 1.3 percentage points. So what that tells you, normally when you get more access, the data drops. But what that tells you is we have children in this district who've had the aptitude to not only do well in the course, but to score a qualifying score and they weren't being given opportunities. So our data just came in and we just did a press release on Monday. I'm going to share this with you. African-American students um, have grown in, in, in actual enrollment in taking these tests almost 67 percent. We went from 1,090 in 22, and that's a huge gain from 21, 22 before I got here to last year, 1,576 kids, right? We also had um, African-American students, actual test takers. It increased from 619 two years ago to 1,004 in just two years. And then their scores went up. Their scores have gone up. The um, mean score has gone up. And we, we, we did a release on it. So what I, the point I'm making is our kids can do this work at a high level, too. And we have a responsibility, especially like, Robert, I'm so happy you're going to be on a school board now. Those are the questions that have to be asked, right? Who has access and who don't? And yeah. what's more important, right? Are we worried about some scores to make our district look good? And then we're stifling kids who also can take advantage because we're worried. Or do we care more about access? And what will happen is the scores will gradually go up as kids become more familiar with the rigor but you got to give them a fighting chance. And so we did that in Kansas city. Um, we're doing it here right now in Anne Arundel and it's just, these numbers are unbelievable. Um, so yeah, it, it's it, a lot of things are, I tell people it's two forms of inequities. When we talk about equity and one form is how the system has been designed system in this country has been designed to disadvantage people of color, marginalized people, by design mm -hmm. but then you have inequities that are adult centered and created by adults that in school systems those inequities harm kids whether it's special education kids whether it's kids who are gifted and talented that we're not pushing they need to be pushed or, or whether it's children of color so I've, I've taken that approach in everything that i do and we just launched our strategic plan and in our plan under every goal there is an equity commitment. I don't know if you can see it. Equity commitment mm -hmm. on every single goal that this community has put together that we will apply as we work to educate the children in this school district. Um, let me just say this, Dr. Medell, because I, I that never it never dawned on me that the adults are the barriers. And 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 I'm I I, I don't know if you guys remember, but I'm from a very small town in Rome, Georgia. And I have to equate my success to having that one black school counselor who was like, you need to apply to this. You need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to be in this class. You need to do this. And I, I didn't have, and I'm, I'm from a small town who didn't, where we didn't really have a lot of resources, but it never occurred to me that other students weren't getting what I was getting, you know? And so that is, that that is thank you for saying that because now now we're giving parents now we're giving them the blueprint to advocate for their kids and if what's you know that your child yeah yeah and what's ahead, important Roz, is it's not at the expense of kids who show up resourced already right like our scores are going up they going up for everybody but because of access you're seeing some faster growth with kids who just never had the opportunity so we're not lowering the standards at the top in order to say we're closing gaps. I'm not with that. My goal is I'm trying to get everybody to 100. percent That's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm glad that, you that, pointed that out. That you pointed that out, Doc, yeah. because a lot of people would try to say that somehow you're lowering the standard to give access to people who don't deserve it, and that's a myth. You know, it, it's always been the myth. You know, in some places you do find that happening, people padding scores and stuff like that. You know, but. The reality is, and we saw this, you know, when we fought for desegregation and we got the integration, we saw it that our children were competing, you know, competitive, always have been, always will be, 
you know, and it was it was a lie that was being told about us, you know, uh, being deficient, you know, and being only on the uh, the negative side of special ed, not the the positive and beneficial side. So I'm, I'm really glad that you pointed right. that out. Doc. Yes, sir. Yeah, it, 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 for sure. Because what we do know is that people will rise to the standard. If you give them a standard, people will rise to the occasion. Every but time. if we but if we do not provide them with that, then then it, it makes them hopeless and it makes them feel helpless. And so I appreciate you saying that. And I hope that other educators that are listening to this or that will watch the replay of this, they will understand the vital role that they play in a student's success. Instead of looking at this individual and, and, and really, um, I run a nonprofit with at-risk girls. These girls, some of them have been written off, but these are some of the most talented, smartest girls ever. They just needed someone to care about them and to be interested in what they were doing. And I mean, they had been written off because by the time they were in middle school, they had been suspended, uh, several fights. Just think they, it was behavioral issues that nobody was really addressing. And I often, when I teach my students now, I often tell them, I'm like, listen, if the child is if the child is not gonna be able to read, if they're thinking about their mama getting her head bashed in all day, That's a fact. they're not gonna be able to read. And so, educators really have to think about the holistic. As you were saying, the wraparound, Robert, like the wraparound that is going on with an individual. Educators really have to be in the mindset of thinking about that, and not just writing a student off as this kid is bad. I don't want to deal with this kid. This kid is horrible. From a school district perspective, Robert, what are the barriers to access for education? Yeah, yeah I think for me, um, I agree wholeheartedly with Mark. I think that um, you know, oftentimes you have you have people that will say, you know, I don't think college is for everybody, right? And ninety nine percent of the time, those people got a college degree, and so it was for you. <laughs> what makes you think it was? Yeah. It's not for everybody else. And uh, yeah. and so yeah. I think that um, it's about having a mindset shift and uh, and helping people understand that we're in the job of helping people actualize their full potential. And I yeah. believe that um, that every child has the potential to rise to the expectation that we set for them, just like you were saying earlier. Um, one of the strategies that I hope to uh, to help support is that, and I want to say uh, in Nashville we have a rock star superintendent. Dr. Adrian Battle uh, is a sister that's doing some amazing work. I had an opportunity to work with her when I was a uh, what we call a family involvement specialist uh, in district, and uh, and so I'm looking forward to uh, to working with her uh, even more and supporting the work that she's doing. Um, but one of the strategies that I hope to focus on is really just engaging and doing more parent education. I think that um, mm -hmm. you know we ask a lot of our school staff. Um, we're asking our teachers and counselors and school psychologists to deal with all of the ills of, our, of society that show up at school every day. And I believe that we can ask a little bit more of the community. And I want to make sure that we put systems in place to work with parents as partners. Um, I think we talk about parent engagement or parent involvement. That's great. But I need you to partner with me as we help guide your mm -hmm. child to the finish line. And we want to give parents specific tools that will allow them to understand what the education process looks like, what opportunities are available. So like these AP courses, if parents know about it, now parents can advocate for it. I think sometimes yeah. districts don't necessarily want parents to know because they're scared that now these parents are going to demand something from them. But that's what I want to yeah. see. I want to see our parents yeah. demand what's best for their children so that our community as a whole can rise. And so that's really one of my um, uh, just talking points around strategies that we need to put in place to ensure that our students are reaching their full potential and uh, and hopefully eliminating barriers or taking potential barriers and looking at them as opportunities for us to turn things around and be successful in those areas. Hey Rob, can I can I just yeah. tag on to something you just yeah, said? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Because um what I hope will happen, especially with you being on this board and you guys are in a major city, so you 
have access to probably a lot more philanthropy than than I do out here. I had a whole bunch of philanthropy in Kansas City. I could mm -hmm. I do I do whatever I wanted because I had money. Yeah. But we we I don't know if Nashville Metro does this, and I know the superintendent. I know her husband. That you're right. They are good people, so mm -hmm. I know them. But um, you know, we made a decision here last year that we were not going to charge kids for taking these ap exams but we it's not sustainable so i had to stop and now but we are all of our kids who are free and reduced lunch many many of them are our children of color we will continue to provide it for them for free um and then everybody else there will be a limit on how many they can take i think it's up to four or something and then parents people will have to have to start paying but we made sure because you made a comment about barrier free, right? Mm -hmm. And part of that barrier free piece is for people who really can't afford, you know, to be able to have a district say we're willing to foot the bill of you to take for your child to take that AP class can be a game changer. It could also see have those numbers really jump for those children. I'm definitely taking a note on that to make sure that we can uh, make that happen because you're right. We do have access. We have, you know, companies like. I don't even know if I'm supposed to say the names of the companies, but we got all types of, of major corporations here in Nashville that um, that can definitely foot the bill for a lot of these programs and are looking forward to opportunities yeah. to do that. And so as a school board member, I hope to be able to engage those communities and, uh, and get them involved in the school so that when we identify a barrier like that, they can help overcome it uh, in a way that's sustainable. And so I definitely hear you on that. And I, I got my notes. And uh, and so now, you know, I'm just getting on the school board. I'll, I actually get sworn in on separate t September 10th. And uh, and so I'm nice. going to be listening a lot. Well, you beginning. have to. I agree. I agree. Don't come in. Don't yep. come in trying to save the world in the first three or four months. It's gonna be it. So I That's agree. It. I'm going to listen. I'm going to learn. And then we're going to come up with a plan of attack. I treat it just like any grant that I've written over the in the past. 20 years of my career. Um, grants are generally three to five years and you, you set up a plan and you got to work that plan and use the resources that you have to make those things happen and get the outcomes that you're looking for by the end of it so that you can move to the next one. So, And I want to give a shout out to Bowie State again. I am also a Bowie State alum, so I'm Bulldog times oh, two. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's where I had my first real job at Bowie State working in the office of institutional advancement so wow very yep. good very nice i'm i'm here for the for this all this hbcu love and you know Bowie just made history by having the first ever black female president dr abenta she's she is amazing amazing so i'm i'm here mm -hmm. for this hbcu love robert it's funny that you say um that was it was going to be one of my questions how can we get parents to be more collaborative but when mm -hmm. i lived in pennsylvania we had to pay school taxes. So <laughs> I used to go to the schools. I, I don't have kids, but I used to go to the schools. I was like, no, I'm, I need to see what my taxes are paying for. And I think if we have a, my, my, my mom used to show up at our school all the time. Like I never got in trouble because I didn't know what my mom was going to show up at my school. Right. Or my, my town was so small that somebody would call my mama, like your child is up here acting a fool. You might want to get here, that kind of thing. And I would did, never want to get in trouble. However, I would go into the schools and I would sit and they were like, oh, which child is yours? I was like, none of them. Why are you here? Because I pay school taxes and I want to see what y'all doing. I I kid you not. They used to be like, oh, OK, come on, Miss Ross, come on in. When they realized that I was going to stay and I was going to keep coming because the reality is I pay school taxes. I want to know what's going on. I want to make sure y'all y'all are really teaching these babies. So Whatever we got to do to motivate you, we're going to get you in the yeah. school. You know, exactly. Right. Exactly. So I, I do, I do appreciate the sentiment of, of bringing the parents in because um, I think that does make a difference. And Dr. Jeff, it's a little different on the higher ed level, mm -hmm. but what are some of the barriers to access to education for higher, for higher ed? Yeah. If, if I can, Ross, before I go into higher ed, I'd like to speak a little bit to, you know, secondary school, you know, even, yeah. you know, primary and secondary. I worked as a school psychologist for years in D.C. public schools, as well as uh, Metro Nashville public schools. I lasted longer in D.C. than I did Nashville. You know, that's a whole nother story. But, uh, <laughs> you know, 
but with DCPS, you know, I actually worked with yeah. DCPS as a school psychologist while I was working on my doctorate at Howard. And, uh, you know, I did a lot of work, you know, in special ed, of course. Uh, in fact, I was placed in a school called Sharp Health School, where the entire population was physically and or mentally disabled. Uh, you know, in Cincinnati, I went to uh, my elementary school was Roseland Condon, where at least 50 percent of the student population was also mentally or physically disabled. Right. And so I had a compassion for that population already. But one of the things I found, though, is that, uh, as Dr. Bedell said, you know, a lot of the adults, you know, were those barriers, you know, because they had these preconceived notions. I would have sometimes have adults come to me and say, hey, Jeff, I need you to diagnose this kid with ADHD. I'm like, huh? And I said, OK, so. You know, I say, cool. So what's, what's the criteria so I can make sure I get it right? And they said, well, I don't know. That's your job. Exactly. Yeah. You know, but it's these preconceived yeah. notions about the behaviors that they're observing. So that was in the school context. Mm -hmm. But then when in my clinical training site at Progressive Life Center, you know, where the children were, you know, I don't call them at risk kids. They were children in at risk situations. And a lot of times yeah. the children are responding according, you know, they're responding accordingly. Like their responses are appropriate for the things that they're experiencing and witnessing. You know, so if it's a, like you said earlier, if a child can't focus in class, it doesn't necessarily mean they can't focus. It just means something else is priority right now. You know, and so what I was finding with the children that we were working with, a lot of them were in foster care, adoptive care services. And uh, there was yeah. a primary trauma. There was an initial trauma that occurred when the, their biological families were disrupted. And because that disruption was never really addressed, it was an ongoing trauma for the kids. And so I began to challenge these ADHD diagnoses successfully. And I was able to successfully replace them with uh, adjustment disorders. You know, an adjustment yeah. disorder is when there's been an, an experience and it's taken longer than yeah. expected for them to adjust. And a lot of times, yeah. and which is a form of trauma, and a lot of times that in, within that adjustment process or adjustment period, they can display behaviors and characteristics that are, that are similar to ADHD, that are similar to certain conduct disorders or major depressive or some of the mood disorders you know, uh, oppositional defiance disorders, all of these different things. And so, you know, yeah. I realized this was, you know, if you misdiagnose somebody, you're almost guaranteed to mistreat them, right? That's almost guaranteed. That part. And, and so when I was able that to part. correct the diagnoses, I was also able to correct the treatment, which included, you know, stepping them down from the prescription medicines that they were given to address what they were claiming was ADHD or major depressive disorder. Uh, and one of the things I found in the kids, they would come to me, one of my most important uh, uh, one of the things that's most important to me was establishing that relationship with the child. And so they weren't my clients, my patients. These are my little brothers and little sisters. And, you know, we had a working relationship. We could talk, you know, even when I was doing an assessment, you know, we'd play basketball before we even began the assessment. You know, we'd play a card game just to make sure that rapport was there. And I didn't have that deficit approach. I approached believing in them that they were going to do better. So much that, a little quick sidebar, so much that their eyes, the, on average, the IQ scores were increasing or growing you know, by 20, 10, 15, 20 points. And IQ doesn't change that much, naturally. Right. Yeah. But what it was yeah. is that the assessor, me, in this context was much different than the previous one. And, and you know, it was a triennial, yeah. so every three years. And so the child felt encouraged. I mean, it was to a point, y'all, to where they would literally start watching me from behind a two-way mirror to make sure that I was administering these tests correctly because they were like- Oh There's my no gosh, are you kidding me? No, I wish I was. You know, to, and it, because the wow. children IQ was growing so much and that's not typical. But I understood why they was observing. I didn't feel slighted at all yeah. because I knew what was happening. Right. I knew these kids yeah. sat across from somebody who they didn't feel intimidated by, who they felt believed in them. You're talking about that adult barrier. Right. That that was a okay. barrier removed. Yeah. You know, this adult is different. Now, what's up, fam? Dapping them up when they come in the room. How you feeling? Talking to talk their language, the swag, everything. And these they were and yeah. people were observing and they would go through my protocol, the scoring protocol, to make sure I didn't make a mistake with the scoring part. And I was good with it. Do that. Because wow. after you do yeah. that yeah. for all of these assessments, then we're gonna come back and have a conversation about why it's legit and what I'm doing. And let me teach other people the same thing. Right. Uh and so you know, that's on the high school level. I mean, that's on the you know, the, when I got to Nashville public schools, MNPS, I love my experience there, but I did one um well, I was working and that we were doing these assessments, of course. And you talk about cultural competency was like not present at all. Cultural humility mm. was not present at all. Wow. And so we would have children yeah. exhibiting certain behaviors. And because the adults weren't aware how these behaviors related to their culture, they were pathologizing the behaviors. Like we had one little oh girl God. who would run away at lunchtime all the time. 
you know, and she she was a Spanish speaking sister and she would run away at lunchtime. She would leave school, but she would come back and they couldn't understand like what's because, you know, she's got this, you know, some type of flight disorder or something. There's a girl, she's ADA. We were saying all kind of stuff. And so I sat down and I talked with yeah. the little sister and I'm like, what, what's happening at home around lunchtime? She said, food. <laughs> she was going home to break bread with the family. I oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I knew what it was. You know, and then people, oh, yeah. well, it's still, and it's dangerous. So she had to understand that she can't do that, right? Because it is dangerous, yeah. but it wasn't pathological. It was culturally appropriate. Right. You know, right. Uh, one other really right. quick scenario, one little buddy, he got caught with crack, you know, and that was a zero tolerance offense. You know, that's ZT. You know, you out of here, you going to the to the zero tolerance school. Uh, and so we were sitting in the session and I was championing for the kid like, hey, this ain't a bad kid. Yes, the behavior was bad. It's intolerable. I said, but what we really ought to be thinking about is how did this little how did this little boy get access to crack? Let's talk about yeah. that. And so we sat around the table We're in the S team meeting and I'm asking all these adults, all these gatekeepers, Dr. Bedell, all these gatekeepers sitting around this table. So I gave him a cultural competency exam real quick and little buddy sitting at the table, too. I said, don't say nothing, little man. I said, hey, y'all, I said, if, uh, if I said that the snowman was a major influence on this kid's life, who am I talking about? You know, he was screaming. He want to say it. He want to say it bad. You know, uh, Frosty. I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> like, no, nah, it ain't Frosty at all. <laughs> you know, it's young. And I said, who is a little man? He said, Jeezy. I said, why he call himself yeah. the snowman? What are you referring to when he says snow? It's oh, that's cocaine. What crack made out of yeah. cocaine? You know, so this was this yeah. whole thing. You know, it's like y'all don't understand these kids. One kid was brought in, getting ready to get zero tolerance. Again, the adults, the gatekeepers, the professionals around the table, you know, uh, I overheard him saying he was going to kill somebody after school. He said, you're going to kill somebody. You took it literally. Yeah. We have to take that literally. I said, I understand the concern, you know? So what was the context? Well, they was talking about, they was all going to meet out on the playground after school and, you know, some type of competition. And he said, he's going to kill the person he was competing against. They're going to kill the person. I said, oh, you ever boy. thought he meant he's going to beat him in the competition? Oh, no, we never thought about that. We'll call him in real quick. Let's ask him directly. Hey man, what do you mean by, kill somebody he said oh i was gonna kill him on the, i was gonna kill him i was gonna race him even won't have a standard chance the cultural competency was lacking but they were ready to send these kids into a zero tolerance lane without understanding better what was happening and you know once that yeah. happens to you your your academic traje trajectory is shot you know that label shot. Is, you're not getting out of the deficit aspect of special ed to excel and, and take these AP tests that Dr. Bedell is open up and that, and that Rob is about to open up in Nashville for our kids. You're not getting back on that track. And if you do use a miracle, yeah, you know, yeah. I tell them all the time, the difference between me and them is that, you know, the difference between me and a lot of people who didn't make it is that they got caught. Yeah. And I yeah. did. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and so that helps me to believe yeah. and to see past what's happening on the surface with our kids. And so, I, I see these gatekeepers and I have the competency to train in the credentials, you know, and a lot of times the position to professionally challenge these things and correct course. And so that's the access to on that level and they even getting into school. And then what I believe on the higher education level, and I work with our kids all the time, our young adults all the time on that level, the number one barrier I see to their success on the, on the higher ed level is their own belief about themselves and their own belief about what they're yeah. capable of. You know, and so one of my favorite classes to teach, two classes I love teaching, intro to psychology or general psychology and any type of African, African-American or black psychology course. <laughs> because I understand that psychology in and of itself as a as a discipline, as, a, as an academic subject, it should be transformative, you know, because what I believe I'm showing our students is their owner's manual. Right. This yeah. is your owner's manual. This is you. This is how you function. This is how all that stuff that happened. Is playing out your life right now and so if you start to understand this and understand what self-knowledge is and the role that plays to your transformation you know you're going to be a force you're going to be you're going to be untouchable in a couple of years as long as you stay the course and you shift your belief about yourself when you incorporate a stronger and more healthy identity right within yourself i was teaching at howard one semester last thing uh had like 170 some students in this room it was the biggest room and it was intro to psych and, you know, I went out on the limb. I said, all right, y'all, I, I got a test for y'all. It's a Friday. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because it's Friday. I said, I'm, I'm going to bet you all, each you $100 that you cannot go this weekend and not call somebody the N-word and not answer to it. And, you know, my word is my bond. Mm -hmm. And it's 170-something students in this auditorium. I had no concern that I was going to have to come up off no money. And I said, the only thing I ask 
is that you tell me the truth when you get back. That's the only thing I ask. Just be truthful with me. So Monday rolled around. Mm-hmm. All right, y'all, who was able to do it? Raise your hand if you was able to do it. They're like, dang. They was like, nope, nobody could do it. And that's the identity piece. And I understand the yeah. strength of that identity piece because I used to think I was one when I first got to fist. And I act like one. I dress like they told us we supposed to dress. I carried myself the way that they told us we supposed to carry ourselves. But through that refinement process and I started shedding that, that's when I became more and more empowered. You know, yeah, I remember I started, you know, growing my locks, all this other stuff. I went through that transformation. And, and that's what I yeah. believe the psychology is supposed to, re, to release that barrier that keeps us from excellence, whether we're on the primary, secondary level or in the higher education level, post-secondary. Oh, that was a whole word, Dr. Menzi. Let me let, let first of all, let me give it up to Morgan State University because they just brought me. I just came in and did um did a trauma informed care for your for y'all's okay. retreat. Okay. And I the, the the for them to understand the need of why that was needed yep. makes me love HBCU so much because yep. they recognize that their students are coming from a variety of lived experiences. Yeah. You know, a lot and of us have you sorry. Yeah. No, 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 ahead, a, lot ahead, us, a lot of our students come to college to get away from the home trauma. Exactly. And exactly. we don't understand a lot exactly. of professors don't understand that those are no y'all. Yeah. You know, and I ask the kids, what what made you come here? You know, some of them is like, you know, I, I just needed to get out. I needed to get away. Oof. You know, and it, yeah. you know, I'll be fighting tears sometimes, yeah. you know, just understanding the stories. Yeah. You know, but yeah, and for Morgan to understand that, right? And for our HBCUs to have the capacity to do that, you know, it's phenomenal. I it just it warmed my heart. And it when I tell you, I do trainings for a lot of people, but that was when I tell you that was the absolute best training yeah. that I felt I've ever done in my career. Yeah. Just because they were so engaged, yep, and they wanted to understand what trauma was. Yep. And you think people think they know what trauma is. But they don't. People really don't understand what trauma looks like. And as you were saying, once you understand why your behaviors, why you're behaving in a certain way, then you can manage them better. And so I think I I love teaching intro to psychology, too. I think when we're able to break that down to our students, they they do. It is a shift. They do begin to see themselves very differently. And and one more thing that you said, Dr. Menzi working in DC, that whole, can you give them this diagnosis? I cannot. <laughs> I'm not going to give them that. Di- I'm not going to make this kid sicker. Right. For you, for insurance purposes, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not doing any of that. And it, it is, it was really bad in DC schools. And I worked in, I don't know if you remember the big chair, the early intervention program. Oh yeah. Yeah. Over Southeast. Yeah. So this program um, had kids from zero to five, and most of the kids were born addicted to drugs. These babies were getting diagnoses of ODD and ADHD before they were even one years old. I was like, you, you, what? I, it That's was ridiculous. Criminal. That's criminal. It, it, well, I, it was ridiculous. I, I was fabricated to the point to where I almost risked not being able to complete the practicum because I was like, I ain't signing off on none of that. I'm not putting my name on that. I'm, I'm not doing that. Because at the end of the day, them, those babies got to walk around with those diagnoses for the rest of their lives. Definitely. You know, I, I, call I, them, I, I tend I call to them do them like you. That's what I call them. Yeah. Yeah. I, t- I tend to do like you when you said that my, my first diagnosis is always adjustment disorder. Mm. It is because... Most of them are adjusting to the changes in their lives. It just makes sense. I'm not going to give them this hard diagnosis unless they are totally, you know, displaying that pathology. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to look at, you know, what the trauma that's taking place in their life at that particular time. But you, you're you absolutely right. Most of our babies are going to college because they got to get away from the neighborhood. They got to get away from the situation. And it, and and the reason why I said it's a little different is because you don't, it's against the law to have any kind of contact with the parents, unless the parents, unless the kid sounds off on it. Right. And so it's kind of hard to get that parental collabor- collaboration because of FERPA. So, we, you know, we can't do those things. So it makes it very difficult um, mm-hmm. in terms of making sure that those students are having access because even if they do have accommodations 
from before. They have to go and get the accommodations themselves as scholar students. The parents can't do it for them. The parents can inquire, but they can't do it for them. The, the student has to do it. And that makes it hard because in that, in, in that sense, that identity piece, students do not want to be identified as mm -hmm. I need accommodations. Right. I need and help. Above, they don't want to be identified. With, true. And a lot of yeah. them are carrying over. They have had IEPs in high school yep. and they carry that over yep. and, and maintain the accommodations in college. And sometimes I challenge yep. the students to, you know, like, you know, we could probably get it to where you don't need these accommodations. So don't, don't, don't leave the cast on too long. In other words, cause you know, somebody take off a cast, your, your muscles don't withered. You all skinny up under that cast now, you know, and if you keep the cast on too long, you know, you're going to wither away. And we're talking about a cognitive cast. So I challenge my students, even yep. when they do come in with these accommodation letters, I totally abide by it. No, no question about it. But I also push them to go beyond yeah. it. You know, don't 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 yeah. rest on it if you don't have to. If you can get it done in the window of time that we're allotted, let's do that. If you can get the assignment done in time, let's do that rather than because I want to strengthen you. Right. I want to strengthen yeah. you. I want you to start yeah. to grow out of that particular identity because it can, you know, permanently handicap you if you don't address it early enough. Yeah. I believe that people can get around these barriers. Well, I, I'm going to be honest. My heart right now is just, I'm just it's smiling from this wonderful conversation with my Fiskite brothers. I thank you all for saying yes. I thank you for showing up in your genius. I thank you for giving us nuggets to really think about. And before we close, I want you guys to give us um, one last thing in terms of education, how we can be advocates for our own education. We'll start with you, Dr. Bedell. Let's let Rob go first. He said his battery was uh, was running low. Oh, okay. I'm Did sorry. Yes. Mind? Go ahead, Rob. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, cool. Um, so I didn't uh, mention this earlier, but I teach at uh, Meharry Medical College now as well. I and so um, I deal with the same type of issues. Um, and I also am the program coordinator. So I work with our, um, we call it CASA, but they basically, they put all of our students' um, accommodations into the system. And I'm sure that our instructors are aware and uh, and support the students in whatever uh, way they need it. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with you, Dr. Menzies. Um, we try to help these students understand that uh, once you go out into the real world, people aren't going to be looking for your accommodation letter. And so right. you have to develop some skills to overcome whatever challenge it is so that once you leave this place, and in, in this case, Meharry, that you're going to represent well and that you understand that people have come before you to set this standard. And, uh, and here's how we'll support you so that you can get to that point. Um, but for me, I think my ultimate goal in education is helping people to understand that everybody has the potential to be great. And it's up to us yeah. as adults and educators to identify the ways to untap that in each and every individual. And it's gonna look different for each and every individual, but that's the job. That's the work that we've signed up for and that we should be engaged in. And uh, and I'm ready for the challenge. And I know with brothers like you that I can call on and, uh, and our Fist family, that we're gonna be able to do some amazing things here in Nashville and hopefully around the country and ultimately around the world. And the reason why I say around the world is uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, but we just started a new school of global health at Meharry Medical College. Dope. And uh, and so this is the first school of global health at an HBCU. And wow. I'm excited about the opportunity to do this work internationally uh, going forward. And so, um, but my goal is just to make sure that we untap that potential in every single individual uh, to make our communities a better place. Rob, let's talk it. offline, brother. Um, I got a nice Caribbean destination that you all can. Yeah, with. You know, I work too. with their ministry. I work with their Ministry of Education already, St. Kitts and Nevis, brother. So, oh, okay, definitely, we'll talk yeah. about that. And I don't know if you know, but my my family's from Trinidad, so of course I know you, Trinity man. Yeah, there you go. So we we gonna make it happen in, in the islands. <laughs> dope, dope. Very, very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Um, um Doctor Doctor Bedell. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think for me it's it's simple. Um, what I hope people will do is just be true um, to who you are. Um, don't lose perspective of why you got into this profession in the first place, and that's to help kids. And um, 
maintain your values and beliefs, right? Don't succumb to an adult centered agenda, a political centered agenda. Um, I think oftentimes people get caught up as you move up in education where you actually have the power to have a lot more influence over the livelihood of children. Too often we lose perspective. We get caught up with the access. You get caught up with the money that you're making and eventually people end up owning you. And I just don't believe in leading like that. I, nobody will have their hand in my pocket. And I think my attitude is, you know, in the end, I don't ever have to do this. The worst that happened to me is I go back and I teach. And I, and I, I, I will be a far better ed teacher than I am a superintendent. So that allows me to be free and allows me to fight in a way that a lot of people can't. Um, and so I just hope everybody, you know, we want to develop people to understand that, like, there's freedom out here. And you, 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 you just have to learn how to educate people on how to maintain that freedom so we can do right. So we can honestly serve the greater good of society. And that's the power we have. So that would be my closing remarks. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Menzi. Yeah. Uh, in closing, you know, I can, you know, I like to emphasize the necessity of self-care, you know, everybody really, set yourself as a priority take care of yourself uh watch the stress the professional stress you know manage that you know and like like what dr bedell is saying you know when other i'll put it in the way that i say it is you know keep your walk away power you know yeah. you, know, you know it's like dave Chappelle said his father told him set your price and once it gets more too expensive once it goes past that line dip walk away you know and, but that requires you to be prepared to do that you have to have another outlet you have to have developed yourself to the point to where you have the confidence to stand in your truth unapologetically and you able to pivot and and not be disrupted for too long you know because the reality is we all got to eat we all got families to feed and so you know you do have to walk a tightrope at times but again mm -hmm. you draw that line and what i found to be the most beneficial thing in my walk is the you know prioritizing my self-care um constantly seeking to be better a better version of me than i was yesterday i'm only in competition with myself you know mm. and, and and by doing that i'm able to be an example for the students that i'm teaching and the people that i'm working with my colleagues you know to empower us all and when i'm talking to the administration you know at the universities that i'm working at i'm like hey you know you you, you want people to be able to stand strong you know on your staff yeah. on behalf of our university yeah. on behalf of our institution on behalf of our students our future you know and so if you allow people to be fully who they are, you know, in the correct way and encourage them to get better, then we can only do better, you know? So be mindful of, of stifling people's voices, you know, be mindful of muting people or, you know, unnecessarily bullying people. You want your people to be strong. You want your people to be healthy. And here are ways that we can do that, you know? So that, that's always been my mission to push that self-care, even to our students, take care of yourself. You know, what's going on with your family? All oh, the hurricane passes through South Carolina is where your people are. You know, let's take a moment on that because I see you distracted in class. Let's get better. Let's learn how to cope with these situations and these issues. And again, I mean, that's, that's what it comes down to, because the reality is when people drop dead on a job, the job replaces them like that. In a heartbeat. People get people. People get, walked out, people get walked out of the job the same day with full schedule of, for the rest of the year to work. And it was no it was, you know, the, the administration today is about to walk you out, but you had no idea. You know, yeah. and so you can give your all to a job, to a profession and get dropped just like that. And so, you know, always prioritize yourself, your well-being, your own uh, competency development so that you're good, no matter what these other people might choose to do. Yeah. Fiskites, thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm a round of applause for for you guys tonight. This was fantastic. I knew it would be. I knew that I was bringing together a great group of individuals that can really talk to the needs of education and to hear from black men that, I mean, it, it just, my heart is smiling. My soul is happy. Nice. So I thank you again. I appreciate you. And um, I, Oh, before we leave, how can people reach out to you? Cause I, Jeff, you have a couple of books, right? It's 10 of them joints. I started yeah. Out. Yeah. You have a couple of books, Jeff. So how can yeah. people, People reach uh, out to you. My website is mindonthematter.com. So you can get everything at the website. Uh, my social media handle is just my name everywhere. Uh, so if I put the real Dr. Jeff Menzi on Facebook, but everywhere else is Jeff Menzi or Dr. Jeff Menzi. 
uh, but mindonthematter.com that's my website and real quick dr bedell rob you know yeah. mark rob you know appreciate you all brothers anything i could do to help you know raj you already know this anything i do to help y'all just let me know man i'm here and you know i, I know how to polish up you know for for, for those very important <laughs> rooms so <laughs> hey not a problem at all same here so i mean yeah. i have um two emails there's the district email uh m bedell at aacps.org and then um you know i also have my uh llc because i do a lot of um speaking around the country uh mark at bedell education.org um i'll be speaking to virginia educators martin luther king day weekend coming up so i'll be at usc nice. in a couple of weeks speaking so and i'll be you know so yeah I, I do a lot of uh those things when when my schedule permits for me to be able to get out in and educate folks that way too so mark at bedell education.org which is bedell educational solutions all right and, and same to all of you all fist family we love you now i'm be calling y'all around homecoming because we're trying to raise some money this year all okay, right <laughs> and, uh, and so we're gonna do it big this year we got a special surprise for uh for our homecoming uh scholarship gala this year uh right. that we'll be announcing in a couple of weeks here um but uh it'll be exciting and uh i hope to see you all uh, here in nashville um but if you want to get in contact with me um uh around fatherhood work it's just robert at newlifeprogram.org and our website is newlifeprogram.org you can take a look at that and uh and see some of the work that we do and uh and then if uh if you're interested in doing some work around education and the work that i do on uh, the school board is robert at taylor for schools.com and it's t-a-y-l-o-r for schools.com so uh, that's how you can get in touch with me and um and i look forward to hearing from folks that are interested in collaborating and doing some work uh i have a conference coming up that i'll be presenting at uh in october uh we'll be in uh, lexington kentucky at their uh kentucky fatherhood symposium uh and so we'll be talking about some of the fatherhood work that we've done uh, over the years and uh and how folks can uh get more involved in the efforts that's sean page stomping grounds lexington yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, very man, good not, thank you again this guys i didn't want to take up your whole night thank you for being here with me and i love you all with the grace of god thank you for the work that you're doing keep doing the work that you're doing you are the cornerstone of our community much love and to y'all thank, thank you everybody you. appreciate y'all thank you uh, thank you Dr. Ross. thank you thank uh, you Thank you, guys.